I'm going to talk for a while, but then I'm going to pause at a number of places. And I'm hoping that some of you can uh, share some feedback through the message forums and through James. And you know, perhaps we can have some back and forth even. Um, let me give a, a bit more context. This is sort of my resume in a non-traditional format. You know, I've worked on mostly you know, I'm American. I grew up in the US, but I've worked um, on three continents, North America, obviously. I've worked in Africa for a bit, and I've worked in Southeast Asia for a bit um, for lots of different work types. And I've got a whole smattering of, of degrees and studies. The only reason I made the distinction of studies is you know, the international development one in particular. I just took courses. The rest of them are, are degree, degree related. But I mean, career wise, I, um, you know, I studied engineering. I studied computer science. I ended up working at this place called the MITRE Corporation, which is a think tank. Technically, it's called an FFRDC, Federally Funded Research and Development, whatever. It's a place near Washington, D.C. It's like a brain trust for parts of the government. And I was a software engineer there. Um, I did that for a while. I ended up taking a job at Virginia Tech um, in essentially their computing and networking services organization because I wanted to get a lot more hands-on and a lot more practical to learn about networking. And I worked with a lot of super smart technicians and we actually physically built the networks and you know, worked with the software, et cetera. Um, I went overseas briefly. I came back again. I worked for this um, startup. It's, it's a startup technically, but not like in the, in the normal form of like what you have in California. It was like a systems integration firm. It was a company with less than 10 people. We, had, we um, did like network engineering, software engineering, project management for large government agencies. Um, and as I'll talk about later, you know, I had, I used to travel quite a bit and I, at some point I just decided I really wanted to go overseas and, and immerse myself in other places to, in no particular order to, to, you know, to have an adventure, to do something useful, to immerse myself somewhere else, to learn more about other cultures, et cetera. And so the path I took was through the uh, US Peace Corps and through this uh, UN organization called UNV, UN Volunteers. So I ended up working with UNICEF in West Africa. Um, and after that, I ended up working with a different UN organization called UNDP, UN Development Program in Vietnam. And I ended up working with a computer company over there, uh, Digital, uh, for many decades. I don't know how many people realize this because they haven't existed in a couple of years, but for, for many decades, IBM and Digital were like the two largest computer companies in the world. Um, I worked with Digital in Vietnam. It was part of their Asia Pacific operation, large infrastructure projects like Vietnam News Agency, for example, you know, they wanted to upgrade all their computer equipment. Um, I ended up coming back to the States and I went to Carnegie Mellon. I got a PhD in this interdisciplinary program. And then I taught for a couple of years um, in a business school locally. And then I've been at Google, as James had said at the outset. Uh, at Google, I am a, what's called a technical program manager, which is uh, typically someone with a like, technical background that just decides they want to um, like organize and lead engineers and engineering programs as opposed to be the one that writes all the code. And I've done a number of different things at Google. You know, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, so I didn't really plan this particular path. You know, I remember a long time ago, you know, I was in high school going off to college. I wanted to study something quantitative, something rigorous. Um, but, you know, I also wanted to be outside. And so I, of all the engineering disciplines, you know, I chose civil engineering because I just imagined I'd be outside as opposed to stuck at a desk. Um, I studied civil engineering. I did several co-ops, which is synonymous with internships. You know, the idea was to find what, what particular part of civil engineering did I want to do, like, you know, structural engineering or geotechnical engineering, et cetera. And what I realized is I didn't really want to be a civil engineer. Um, but what I really did enjoy was, uh, you know, I'd spent a lot of time writing code to, like, basically to automate engineering calculations. And I realized it was the computer, the tool, that tool I enjoyed and I found fascinating. It wasn't so much the problem I was trying to solve. So I ended up switching to CS. I got a master's in computer science and then, you know, started my life as a software engineer. But that's my background. I'm going to sprinkle a tiny bit later, but let me bring this back to you guys since this is a workshop for you and not to hear my, my story. Um, you know, about the gap year. I mean, sometimes if you guys have probably encountered this because you're actually taking one. Um, you know, oh my God, how can you do this? It introduces risk, it introduces uncertainty. You know, yes, I mean, you, you can't really argue with it. Of course, it introduces, introduces uncertainty, right? It's not like you're just going on from third to fourth you know, year and then getting your job or going, continuing to grad school. Um, but I mean, to me, a gap year, it, aside from maybe even aside from the initial motivations of, you know, you have to work through Zoom, you know, as a, and pay all the tuition, you can't really have the normal campus life because of the whole world, you know, COVID situation, et cetera. It's a huge opportunity, even under normal times, to really explore yourself and the world and just to learn a bunch of stuff, right? And, but, you know, I listed out some th things here in the third paragraph. You know, what organizations look for, I mean, what, what are really useful career skills aside from very domain specific knowledge? 
you know, or things like leadership and dealing with ambiguity and collaborating. I mean, there's lots of ways to do that. It doesn't have to be in a traditional company or corporate environment. Um, and so if you feel like a need to, to justify it to yourself and to others, I, I guess that's kind of the point of this. Sure, it introduces uncertainty, um, but there's a lot you can get out of it that would help you develop as a person, but even you, you could frame as helping you with your career, even if it's not a more traditional way to do it. Um, there's a bunch of takeaways I want to have in here. And this is, this is one of them. Um, the point here, I mean, literally, this isn't the words here, which is, you know, focus on optimizing your life. This is like my suggestion pretty much to everybody, you know, versus just optimizing on your career. It may be your career is the most important thing in your life. And then fine, there's not that much of a difference. But quite often, you know, your life is this big pie chart and your career, or, you know, the circle and the, your career is a big, is a subset of that, right? And so a lot of the decisions I made in my career um, were in the interest of optimizing my life, like things that I wanted to go do. It wasn't necessarily to earn the most money or to, it definitely wasn't to earn the most money or to advance, you know, the fastest on the corporate ladder, et cetera. Um, you just need to figure out what's important for you and just think about your life and how you optimize that with your career being a super important part of it, as opposed to your career first and then your life off to the side somehow. And, and so, Part of this is, you know, as you think about like either in your gap year or starting your career and, and you know, what are you going to do first? And you have to like nail that, that particular opportunity, you know, finding good opportunities, of course, is important. And, you know, they, they're the, the step you're taking, they will help you develop, you know, it will influence you, you'll make contacts and friends, et cetera. Um, but I also don't want to overstate that. I mean, your first job is your first job. It is the next step on some journey you, you will take through life, right? Um, I wouldn't, it's not like you have to have the perfect next first job and then otherwise your career is, is all messed up. That's kind of the point here. Let me step back into, into my world just for a little bit because I'm going to use some of this um, as context for some of the takeaways. And the thing I want to emphasize here is um, I, I am not suggesting you to do the things that I did. I'm not suggesting my path is the right path for anyone else. Um, it's the takeaways, the, it's the lessons from that that you know, I'm looking for you to take away, okay? Like, for example, I had decided, you know, after lots of travels and lots of work and lots of vacations that, you know, I wanted to immerse myself overseas and the place I wanted to go do this was in Vietnam. There was a whole bunch behind it, you know, why, why on earth did I want to go to Vietnam? This is about 25 years ago in the mid 90s. Um, but I decided, this actually, I wrote some LinkedIn articles if you're interested in the detail, I'm happy to talk to you. But I decided that was the thing. I, I took a lot of steps to try to make that work for me. Um, but I, it didn't work. And I ended up actually finding this completely unexpected opportunity in West Africa. Um, I wasn't looking at West Africa, it was Liberia specifically, but I found something over there um, that they had enough appeal that I ended up taking that thing, okay? Even though it, it faced value, it was like not even the last thing I would look at. It wasn't even on the list of things I was looking at. And then after a year or so, I ended up actually finding something back in Vietnam where I ended up working for three or four years, partly with the United Nations, partly in the private sector, um, corporate, you know, in the tech sector. All right. So this is where I'd like to get a little bit more interactive here. Um, what I'd love for you to take away from this whole thing is that if you are thinking of things that you, helping you understand and make decisions around things that you'd like to do that perhaps are not as conventional or you have to maybe sell yourself or sell others. Um, and so specifically, you know, think about your own situation for a, a couple of minutes or for a couple of moments. You know, is there some job or career transition you'd like to do, but it, it seems crazy based on quote unquote normal criteria or you just not, you feel stuck and you're not sure how to go forward. Um, if you want to share a couple of things through the, the chat and through James to me, that's fine. Otherwise, I'm just going to pause and I'm going to continue. But um, the, the space of job and career transitions, I guess where I'm most interested in helping and having conversations are where it's difficult. Someone wants to do something, but it seems insane, but somehow they still want to do it or they're just stuck. They're not sure how to do it. The more conventional ones, I'm not sure how much value I can add. You know, the, the more conventional, there's a lot of other people that could help with that. So I'm going to pause for a moment just to give you a few minutes to think about this, a few moments to think about this. And James, let me know if, you know, anything comes through or I'll just continue. I won't, I don't want to have an awkward pause for too long. Yeah, I'll, I just post the, uh, the link to the Dory again. We can wait a few moments to see if students have a few okay. ideas.
there is one question here that is uh, for someone who wishes, let me pull it up. For someone who wishes to live all over the world throughout the course of their life, how does one maintain a sense of stability in their professional career? Which I think kind of aligns with that sort of feeling of uh, feeling like it's a little crazy or a little bit hard to hard yeah. to, to get around. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, I love the, I love the sentiment in the question. Um, I would just just focus on doing this once first, or this you know the next time if you've already done it. Um, I mean, I think the amount of stability that, that, that someone needs, you know, you figure out over time. You don't have need to figure out what do you want to be doing in 20 years from now because, you know, you'll, you'll be a, a lot different, not a lot different, but you'll be a lot wiser about who you are, you know, after a long time. And so I would look for something that's interesting now that gives you enough stability that you enjoy it, you know, for this next step. And then during that step, you can figure out the next one. Um, I mean, there's no magical universal answer. And I think you can figure it out as you go along. Just figure out the next one, I guess would be my response. Jacob Moore asked, for someone interested in working abroad, what do you think uh, are some, some important steps someone can take to prepare for that and find opportunities? Uh, it depends on the kind of work you want to do. I mean, um, there's no better way than just meeting people doing, I guess the generic answer, general answer would be figure out how to, how to meet and talk to people that are doing something that you think you want to do just to have conversations and just to learn about it. Um, because that will help you, it will give you information to help you figure out how to do it, but also it, it may surface op openings. Um, Jacob, let me know if that's, if there's a, if there's a follow up to that one. Um, yeah. Sure, I will let you know if there's a follow up. And I have a question as well. Um, around switching majors. I've switched majors a couple of times. What do you suggest uh, to students to find their academic passion and stick with it? Yeah, I, you're, I've changed, I've had many majors, changes in, in degrees. Um, so is it about how to find one, what one really wants to do or is it how to, to not switch? Uh, um, I, mean, I think just guidance let, let me, around switching majors. Yeah. Um, I mean, a general statement, I'm not specifically addressing this, but I will come back to it. And I, I know this sometimes is perceived as a luxury. I, I feel like undergraduate degrees are an opportunity to get educated and not just trained. I mean, you've got the rest of your life and maybe even grad school in, in some cases, you know, to get trained to do a job. Um, you know, it, it's good to sink your teeth in and allow yourself to get to know something well enough before you switch. You know, sometimes you're doing something that's very clear. This is not what I want to be doing. And of course, you know, believe it and, and go do something else. Um, but you also need to commit enough of yourself to give yourself a chance to actually know the thing. You know, to, to state maybe some obvious things, be, because it's difficult doesn't mean it's the wrong thing. It just might mean it's a hurdle to get over. And so, you know, figure out, yeah, I guess it's this balance of flexibility of you want to do absolutely what, what, where your passion is, but at some point you need to finish, right? There's financial constraints, there's time constraints, et cetera. Um, yeah, I, again, I hope that's useful. It's hard to have a, a one-off response there. No, absolutely. Um, and a question on how do you how did you find out about these these opportunities? If the jobs in, in in West Africa wasn't even on your list, how did you even find it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I wrote two long LinkedIn essays. You, you should go read, but, but I'm happy to tell you the short, short version. Um, I, I really wanted to go to Vietnam, so. I ended up becoming, I became a, um, I applied to, and I became, became a Peace Corps co-sponsored United Nations volunteer. Um, it is an extremely long, it used to be in paper. I mean, a really deep, that long application process. By applying to that program, I got, essentially got my name in a list, in a, in a, in a database basically, where, you know, people in, in these various countries, in the UN programs that had needs, you know, um, would go looking, gee, I need someone that knows something about databases, you know, or so, something like that. Um, I, when I first applied, you know, that, that was the message of, hey, you should wait. I, in that case, in that time, I really wanted to go to Vietnam. And so what I did, it, it took me a couple months to realize this, but I kept contacting and calling basically the guy in Vietnam saying, hey, I'd like a job there. And he kept saying, you got to wait, you got to wait. So I ended up, I ended up calling this guy in Vietnam and said, hey, by the way, I'm going to be there just a total chance on vacation. Can, is you okay if I come by your office? Uh, he said, sure, of course, you're in, you're in town. That entire trip was construed to go see that guy. Okay. And so I walked over there and we met and I, through him, 
you know, I, I made some contacts, et cetera. That ended up falling through. That was the, you know, try to get to Vietnam didn't work. Um, the, the Africa thing actually did come because the um, guy named Carl Tinsman, who was the UNICEF country representative, one day did find my name in a database. He contacted me and said, hey, do you want to come to Liberia and, and do this thing? Um, so that, that part was sort of passive because, you know, my name was in a list and eventually he went looking, for, you know, who was nuts enough to go over there. Um, but generally, like if you want to go to a particular place, I would say this is related to one of the earlier questions. Find ways to have contact with people that are doing the thing you want or in the space, you know, the area that you want or the organization or, or something. Just like try to touch that space physically or, you know, through people or whatever. And just through serendipity and through connections and through ideas, you, you'll figure out how to get connected there. Um, in Vietnam specifically, I used to tell people when they, you know, I would get calls or emails or whatever from people in the States. Hey, I want to get a job there. Can, you know, do you have any ideas? It was really risky, but I used to tell people, I said, the best way to get a job here is just to physically put yourself on the ground and just, you know, find something to do for a couple of months and through networking, you'll find something. And I, I knew a guy who did this. He was, he was amazing. He was so brave. He came out with his, his, his wife and at that time, four young kids and they landed in Hanoi with no job. And he ended up, you know, making a career. He ended up being like UN environmental representative in China at some point. Like he just, they were willing to, to park themselves. I was single at the time. It's easier if, you know, if you're not with a whole family, but you know, sometimes families are into that as well. Um, so I guess the, the TLDR, the, the, uh, the short version of this is find ways to, to, to have contact with people in the area that you're looking for. There's nothing better than that because the, the period, there's nothing better than that. There's no magical way other than that. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question from uh, Tamara as well, as to saying, I'm really interested in how you merge policy and tech. Could you talk more about that? I want to do policy work in a tech field, but I'm unsure how to present myself as someone with policy knowledge with my engineering background. Also, what are different types of policy you have worked on? Sure. Um, so most tech companies I'll start answering this. If I, if I miss a piece of this, James, please remind me. Um, most tech companies, I mean, I work for YouTube now. Um, YouTube is deeply affected by policy. I mean, you know, everything from the, well, there's a lot of interest in, in policy. You know, both some of the policy is, you know, what's, what's legitimate content on, on the site to, you know, congressional hearings, et cetera. So most tech companies have some policy arm. Um, and so, there are actually jobs and in, in people that are involved in policy explicitly in, the, in these companies, um, especially the bigger ones that have to pay attention to this stuff. Um, my, my, I guess my own policy work ended up happening indirectly. So when I was building like information infrastructure in places like in Vietnam and I was with UNDP, I used to view that as very applied policy. Like I went to, um, in this country, there's an organization called FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency that you know, deals with the responses to, we have a hurricane in Louisiana or Florida or something. When I went to Vietnam when it, on the UN project was to help set up an infrastructure in an office for Vietnam's version of FEMA. They have a lot of water related disasters and the aftermath of that was very hard for them to, to deal with in terms of like damage assessment, needs assessment, communications, et cetera. And so I worked the technology for like a, to implement policy, which is to take care, you know, help the population there. And so I kind of view that as very applied. When I went to Carnegie Mellon and did my uh, second set of graduate work there, I, I was in a department that's called engineering and public policy. So like at CMU, there's a public policy school, which I'm oversimplifying, but you can think of like, you know, how do we deal with, you know, crime policy, you know, for example, right? Things that aren't necessarily technical, super important, but not technical. In the engineering college, there is something called engineering and public policy where you, the policy, you really need to understand the, the engineering or science behind it. And the best example probably isn't the work I did, but like people that studied, um, that were, chemical engineers or chemistry majors that wanted to study policy, like air pollution regulations, as an example, right? It's easy to throw things out there, but it certainly helps if it's grounded in science, right? And so there's someone with an engineering or technical background that wants to inform the public policy. That, that's one aspect. So that's kind of how, that, that, that was a set of studies that I did. You know, the, um, the tech companies, you know, like I said, have a lot of policy because they just have to, like Facebook, YouTube, Google. There's other ones, but these are the three that, you know, are most prominent in my mind. By the way, for any of these, uh, to the audience or to James, I'm happy to follow up, you know, separately by, by an email or something as well, if people would like to actually have more of a conversation. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Joshua. I do have another question um, from an anonymous uh, student sure. on the Dory. 
after a certain point in college, you start to become more limited in the classes you have to take. Do you have any ways to get around this feeling or any tips on having a different mindset, especially if you're starting to feel ha unhappy or stuck? It sounds like you're ready to graduate and move on. <laughs> it might make sense just to graduate and move on and you can go back to school later if you need to. Um, I, I don't mean to be flippant. I'm not sure how else to answer that. Um, yeah. I, again, if you'd like to whoever said that, if you'd like to reach out, I'm happy to talk more, but it, it generally sounds like you've, maybe exhausted what you could get out of that program and just find the shortest path you can at this point to graduation. Or pick up another I have two more yeah, specific questions. Um, one is I'm studying CS, but I want to do something in music and audio engineering, but there are few opportunities for someone not in that field. What are your thoughts? I am not a musician. I come from a family of musicians, but I'm not one. Um, I don't really have a good answer. I mean, I can think of like practical hobby oriented things and I can think of academic programs where you could probably blend these two more. I'm not sure which, which way you want to go. You know, university wise, there are probably courses and in, in programs that, that do blend these things a bit more. Um, certainly a lot of CS majors, you know, a lot of people that like CS or math, you know, like music, there's a lot of you know, correlation, causation probably amongst these three even. Um, Sorry, I don't really have a better answer, but again, I'm happy to follow up if you, if you could maybe explain a bit more to me another time. Maybe one more and then we'll move on. Yeah, yeah one sure. More. One more question I will grab. Uh, is, I'm currently pursuing a Bachelor of Arts, but I plan to attend a coding boot camp as soon as I graduate. Is there currently a stigma against coding boot camp certifications in the tech industry? I used to think there was, but I'm not convinced there is anymore. So, um, I don't think it matters. You know, if you're studying whatever you're studying and you want to learn coding, then, you know, learn coding and, and develop good skills and you, you'll get, get to do it, you know. Um, I mean, I think historically and in general, I mean, there's a difference between, for example, coding and, you know, software engineering and being a software architect. They're, they're related. They're all related to code. Um, the camps teach you how to code. And, you know, over time, one could learn the more advanced skills of like how to build an engineering system, which you can think of as, um, the difference between like writing code that, that, that works and generally does something versus, you know, like the code that runs Facebook, for example, right? That's production code that takes a lot of software engineering. It's, there are like software architects involved that, that design systems. Um, and so coding is part of that, but I mean, I, I don't think it, it my, my own personal view, if, if you're asking, you know, I think going to, to, to a coding boot camp teaches you how to code. And I think that's terrific. I, there's no bias there, but I, I, to me, that's not equivalent to say a CS degree because something else happened in the other three and a half years of school, right? I mean, there's other aspects of engineering that are valuable as well, but coding may be sufficient and maybe the, the shortest path to getting to do what you want to do. And by the way, lo there's lots of people that are really smart in data science, computer science, just to pick two fields that don't have CS degrees. I was just reading, I just started reading this book recently by this, um, I think his name is Jeremy Howard. He's a USF professor who was like one of the leaders in like use of PyTorch and deep learning, et cetera. He's got a degree in philosophy. But, you know, he's a super smart guy and he figured out how to do this. And so I wouldn't worry about the stigma so much if that's the path that, that's accessible to you to go to do what you want to do. Okay, I'm going to move forward a bit. There's, um, so the next series of, this series of slides, maybe the next three, four, maybe five, I don't remember how many I put in here. These are um, kind of takeaways, things that I learned in, in making some of my own decisions of job choice, job and career choices that I did. And, and actually, I just realized I should give a bit more background. So when I went off and I said before I wanted to go off to Vietnam, what I was doing was I was a software engineer in, in the Washington DC metro area. Um, you know, I, I had a great job. I earned a lot of money, you know, like, like here, I mean, people disposable income, right? It was, it was quite good. You know, it was comfortable. I had lots of friends, lots of things that were, were terrific, right? I just wanted to go do something different. And it was, you know, what I ended up doing was going off to Liberia. And I don't know how many of you know this history. Back in the mid 90s, they were, they were in the middle of a seven sided civil war. It was a pretty nasty place. Um, but I ended up going there, not because it was a nicer place, because it had more job security, or because I knew people, or because it paid more, or go, you know, any, anything else in this list. It didn't do any of those. It made for some pretty interesting conversations. Um, but it did satisfy other things that I wanted to do, which was do something international, do something useful. I felt, you know, reasonably protected by the UN in that particular context. 
Um, when I was thinking of going off to Liberia, the obvious risk is you're going off to a, a war zone. You know, do you feel sufficiently safe with the environment there? And I convinced myself that was a risk, but it was it was mitigated by the UN, et cetera. The part that actually blocked my decision more was, you know, this is a temporary job. What happens when I'm done? Like the, the job in security is what really scared me. Um, and you could argue that it was a dumb thing to be scared about relative to the other one, but that's the, that's the part that, you know, from a decision process that I was stuck on. And this uh, friend and mentor of mine brought me through this conversation, essentially this question I'm putting on the screen here, what's the worst thing that could happen? And we went through this and it was something along the lines of, well, what's the worst that would happen? You know, I go over there and I come back and I have no job. He goes, okay, what happens if you have no job? And I said, well, I won't be able to earn money. He goes, what happens if you can't earn money? And you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, that's not good. I don't want to end up living on the street or, or whatever, right? I mean, but you know, I'd been fortunate to have some savings and we kind of went through this process and I realized, well, the worst case is I would come back with no, no, no job, no decent job that I can get quickly, but I could probably get some job somewhere, you know, like a bookstore, something to sustain myself. And so like, what's the worst that could, could happen from the part of this that I was focused on was like well, come back and have to take a temporary job until I can get a real job. And as soon as I did that, it, it really unblocked me. It's like, oh, I can live with that. But the, the takeaway here is for the, your own crazy thing, I mean, to really on your own or with somebody, I mean, someone you can have a conversation with that ideally doesn't have a huge vested interest in this, like, you know, your mom or your dad, maybe who, you know, are more concerned about your safety or, your, or whatever, right? Um, there's no diss to your mom or dad, you know what I mean? Find people that can give you some honest, transparent feedback there without being invested in the outcome. Um, and just to understand what's the worst that can happen. And this is not about, you know, you should do the thing even in spite of the worst thing, but to at least expose it and then you can make a better decision of, oh God, I don't want that or that's actually okay. Um, I'm actually gonna flip through some of these, James, even though there's a question at the bottom here, I'm happy to take some, some questions at, at the end here, okay? So th this, this slide and the next several are, are I guess if you take away nothing else from this, I would say these are questions and, and ways to look at your own decisions that I think could be very helpful. Um, another one is about unbundling opportunities to, you know, to see if they're actually worth taking. Even if at face value, they seem like crazy. Like that Liberia thing I talked about, again, this is the details are for me. I'm not advocating you go off to Liberia in the middle of a war, but I wanted to go to Asia. I didn't want to go to Africa. You know, I didn't know anybody there. It was dangerous. It was like literally the opposite, literally in the opposite side of the globe of where I wanted to go. I ended up going because I realized I wanted to break into those UN um, contexts. I wanted to, um, to live overseas. You know, I thought I might meet people there that would open up other doors later. There's a bunch of other details, but just like try to imagine unbundling the opportunity into all the pieces, you know, some of which are obvious, like, of course, I don't want that, but maybe there's other stuff in there that you actually hadn't thought of that would make it worthwhile. Um, Another one here is around uncertainty. It, I don't know if it's my brain or human nature or what, but it's easy to assume if uncertainty means you know, bad things will happen. And of course, they, bad things might happen. And please don't leave this talk saying, you know, Joshua said, don't worry about bad things. That's, that's not my message. Um, it just, uncertainty goes both ways, right? Like the UN thing that I did in, in Africa, um, some of the wonderful things that happened there, one is I ended up getting plugged into the UNICEF global technology team that was based in New York, but you know, had people all over the world. I did know nothing about them. It was a huge, it was a fantastic group of people. I really generally had a lot of fun working with them. And the international community that I worked with in Africa, um, I, you know, I had this perception that, you know, the UN, it was this big bloated organization. They were in New York and then people living cushy jobs around the world. Um, no one drifts off to a war zone, you know, for, for the scenery, right? It was, I ended up, interacting with and getting to know a bunch of people that were extremely, extremely motivated by what they were doing. And that was just a wonderful environment for me. It, I was motivated and it was just, it was just a really energizing place to be um, just by virtue of the people that I got to interact with. Um, not to mention the actual local population, the librarians, et cetera. I mean, there's a whole bunch of goodness that came out of that that I hadn't even expected. You know, I was thinking that, well, you know, maybe this, this'll, this'll suck for six months and then, you know, but at least I've had my international experience and it wasn't anything like that. Um, This next, there's a lot of words on this slide, but this next one relates to a bunch of comments I made earlier, I think even in response to some of the questions. Um, it, it's, it's useful and good to have a goal, you know, but some to, even whether you have that goal or not, just taking like 
small steps towards something have a lot of value. You don't need to hold out until you get the ultimate thing. Um, so I have a bunch of different phrases of this I've just thought about over, over time. You know, do the thing you're hungry for and that get you closer to the thing you're aiming for. You know, part of this is just understanding like what it kind of excites you internally, you know? Or kind of, if you generally want to get there, you're not sure how to get that job or that opportunity in that other country. I mean, just do some things that get you closer, such as, you know, reaching out to people or maybe volunteering locally with in some environment or with some people that somehow are affiliated with that thing. Some of this is by, you know, if you take one step, you'll see the next step. Some of it is you take that one step, you'll understand yourself better in that context better. Um, and the last one here, design your life step-by-step. Step. This is paraphrased from a book I just started reading recently. Um, it's called Designing Your Life by, by two folks at Stanford. Um, and it, to me, that it's a very similar kind of message about just take steps towards the thing you want to do. And the, Part of it is to help you figure it out, but part of it is it's a much lower risk way to do that. And, and I'll give you, I, I was thinking last night, there's an example of this in my life where I did just the opposite of this. And it explains to me why things were so hard. When I was in Vietnam for four years, I decided to come back to the States and go back to grad school and get a PhD. Um, the first month I was back in school was, was frankly brutal. I hadn't been in school in, in you know, probably a decade. You know, there's a lot of things you just kind of carry forth in state knowledge, et cetera. And so I took this big leap of, you know, I was working, time to shift. I want to go back to grad school for a couple of years. Um, a baby step there, or more of a step-by-step, -step might have been to take a couple of courses you know, in that area. And, and then I probably would have done something similar. But the step-by-step and -step doing experiments, it helps you. They're fairly low risk, and they help you get closer to the thing you want anyway. There's almost no reason not to do that type of thing. Here's another one. Um, it's good to get input and to listen to your friends and people around you, but don't let that make the decision for you. Um, in, again, in my own experience, when I went, I became, when I went to Africa and Vietnam, I was initially a, um, and contractually, I was a Peace Corps co-sponsored United Nations volunteer. So there's a contract, there's some money involved, but I, when I went from being a software engineer to Africa, I probably took like a 60% pay cut. When I went from Africa to Vietnam, I probably took another 60% pay cut. Um, I'm not advocating, again, the specifics, but the, I took, the way I phrase this in my own life here is I took two consecutive 60% pay cuts and the quality of my life skyrocketed. There's not a formula there, okay? There's not you know, any magic math. All I mean is when I went and became a volunteer, my goal wasn't to earn less money. My goal was to do something there. And because of my, the graduate degrees and my engineering and my training, what I didn't want to do was say, well, I've achieved this, so how on earth could I do that? You know, I wanted to do the thing I wanted to do, and it seemed silly that because I had achieved something before, I should block myself on this, even though it, to some people it seemed dumb initially, okay? Um, and so the whole point here is just at least be honest with yourself, and it takes some soul searching for a while to figure out, you know, are you, are you saying no to something because of ego or because it's a legitimate reason not to do it? The second one's super important. The first one you should decide if it's important. Okay, my last slide. Um, this is, again, this is one of my favorite life quotes here. You can spend all of your time trying to make the right decision, or you can just make a decision and spend all of your time trying to make it right. Um, I used to be much more prone to lots of analysis and like me deciding to go overseas and do these Africa things, et cetera. I literally thought about these things for years before I actually got my act together and applied. And, and then I had to wait a year you know, for the actual process. Um, Analysis is important to understand yourself, to understand risks, all of that. It's super important. But at some point, you just need to make, it, make a call. And, and the, the point here is, um, even with uncertainty, if you invest some portion of, of your time allotment into making the thing work, you can end up with, you can choose something imperfect and make it more perfect just by virtue of just sinking in and just doing the thing. Avoid analysis paralysis is another way to say this, but I, I like these words better. Okay. That's my prepared stuff. I'm happy, you know, as long as people want to hang out to uh, answer some more questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Joshua. Uh, it was really, really helpful. And I, I do have a question that came up during, during your um, presentation, and I would love to see some more uh, as, as we go forward. But one from Hamza, which is, how can one immerse themselves in academia through a P PhD and a postdoc and then enter the tech startup world around 30? You can do it later. I did it later than that. Um, 
part, part of the answer is when people say, how can you do this? You know, you should have done this before. It's like, but I can't go backwards. This is where I am. All I have is, is now and, and going forward. And so if you're asking if it's possible, I would say, sure. If you have a PhD and a postdoc in a field that's valued, I mean, you're going to be highly valued by people in the tech world. Um, if it's about academia, like you're somehow branded or your mind or is molded to academia, you know, there is an adjustment to working as a practitioner in, in industry, but it's not impossible. I mean, um, yeah, I've worked, I'm, I'm a lot more, I'm a lot older than 30. I've worked a lot more than, than, you know, the years a 30 year old would, but I don't think it's ever, it's, there's lots of things you can do. I mean, there is conventional knowledge, which is like the average, you know, like if you think of sports and stuff, right? On average, nobody wins, you know, because someone always wins and loses. You, you can, you can always make things work if, if you have the, the will, you know? So don't let that block you, I guess, maybe is, is the most useful thing I can say there. It doesn't mean it's easy. It just don't make that block you. Don't let that block you. Don't let norms block you. Maybe that's the message. Okay. Awesome. I have one from Levy, which is a question on uh, a follow-up to Hamza's question. Is age a factor when trying to get a job in tech? I, I don't know how to answer this, <laughs> you know, um, if I look at the whole distribution of people in tech, you know, there's a side of that curve that I'm on one side of. Okay. You know, if you can see the ring, rings around my head, um, I don't really think so. I mean, I, I hesitate to say it doesn't matter, but I, I don't think again, this should block. I mean, you know, if you have the skills and the wherewithal, you know, I would, and there's something you really want to do, then I would try to do it. I mean, you can't make yourself younger. All you can do is deal with where you are. And so there are is certainly, you know, there's certainly many more people that are, you know, earlier in, in the mid middle of their career at, at Google, for example, or in tech, than there are people at the other side of their career. Um, you know, I think a lot of that is life choices as much as anything else, you know, I, I don't really want to talk about ageism, et cetera, et cetera, on a recorded call here, but, you know, I, again, I don't think that sort of thing should block you. You know, you, you can't, you can't make yourself younger. You are where you are and you just you make the best of it. Okay. Awesome. Joshua, I have a question from Alina. Um, how did you decide that it was time to come uh, back and go back to school? How do you know when you've had enough international experience? That's a great question. Fair questions. Um, let me start with the international experience part. So I, I lived in Vietnam for four years. Um, there's a bunch of things I love about, you know, the culture of the country, the, the, the chaos, at least it used to be more chaotic than it is now. And if you've ever traveled in like Southeast Asia or, or many developing countries, you know, there's a lot of chaos if you think of like markets and streets, et cetera. Um, the, you know, some of it is the chaos in, in, in the heart, in the, in the resourcefulness, et cetera. I mean, sorry, let me, let me back up here. To me, I, it was time to go when all of the things I used to find satisfying, you know, all the challenges and, and the, the craziness and the things that were very different than where I grew up, when uh, for a persistent, in a persistent basis, those things started to become really annoying and a headache to me more than, you know, invigorating to me. That was my own internal signal. Um, I don't think there's a... a you know, there could be other factors like family or financial, et cetera. For me personally, I just felt like I was getting a little burned out, frankly, you know, when I was in Vietnam. I, it was wonderful for four years and I just felt like you know, I need a break. And, you know, a one month vacation wasn't going to cut it anymore. Um, what was the other, the first part of that, James? I f sorry, I forgot. Oh, going back to school, deciding to go back to school. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of reasons for this. I mean, sometimes as you, you feel like you, you want to take your career in either to a next level or another level or your slightly, slightly different direction. Um, I mean, in my own personal case, when I was working and I went back to grad school, part of it was, was personal as well. Um, I was a, the equivalent of a technical program manager, like managing very large infrastructure projects. And, and it felt like for me to advance at that time, I would have to take on bigger and messier and larger headache projects. And I was looking to, to partly build skills and partly build credential in something more than being a technologist. You know, I studied this thing called engineering and public policy and then threw in finance into the, into the stew. Um, 
because I had interest there and I, and I wanted to be able to contribute more than just the technology side of it. Um, the personal side of this also is I had gotten married a couple of years before this. I had, you know, my, I have three kids. My first child um, was newborn and I, and I thought, you know what, maybe this is just kind of a, a chance to do something different for a couple of years. So there's sort of like the time of life thing. Um, the last part of this, and this is entirely on me, is I had always thought I would someday I would go back for a PhD. I was at this point of this transition of I'm, I'm ready to do something else. And I thought, you know what, I should either, if I'm ever, ever, ever going to do it, now is the time. Didn't mean I had to do it, but it, you know, if I'm ever going to do it, now is the time. And so I just I decided to do it. Um, yeah, full stop. Again, this, this is, these are very personal conversations, so I'm happy to have a conversation if that's useful with, with a person's own details. Yeah, also, Josh, I'd like to, uh, if possible, if you have time to sort of invite you to our, our smaller Slack as, as a cohort, and maybe you could answer a couple questions following this um, sort of sure. presentation on that. That would be awesome. Okay. I do have a question, a uh, career-based question from Alina, which is, can you tell us more about your tech PM role at Google? What does a PM do on an average day? Sure. Um, so I'm a um, technical program manager. And, and so there's a distinction at, at Google, at least, between technical program manager and product manager. They sometimes use the same acronym. Um, a technical program manager, there's a couple things. So I'm part of a larger engineering team. And the so I'm part of this, this organization called YouTube Data Engineering, which is a bunch of teams together. All, there is a director of that who runs that, the, the engineering lead, who, um, who's my manager and who I partner with on a lot of things. Some of what we do is say there's some engineering capability, like there's some, some new feature that one needs to get built out by engineering teams and there's many, many teams. And so the technical program manager would be the one that helps um, organize that in terms of, you know, what are the teams involved? What are the milestones? And then work with the engineers to, as they execute. So the engineers are the ones writing the code, but quite often the technical program manager is the one that keeps us all stitched together and moving forward in terms of, you know, reasonable milestones or, you know, when we get blocked, unblocking that or dealing with communications. And so helping, um, helping large engineering efforts that span many, many teams actually execute and deliver something. That's one part. Another part is because I'm part of a very large engineering team, there's a lot of things just to help our team um, execute more, more effectively. So the first part is, you know, to deliver something like there's a new feature, help engineering teams deliver it. The second one is how do we be sure that the team is actually, you know, operating efficiently in a, in a healthy way. And so, you know, there's different ways you can measure things on a team. In that sense, we're kind of an extension of, um, of the engineering director. Yeah, this, that's kind of, yeah, that, that's my answer. I, I realize it's, it's a little bit vague in places. Again, like every one of these, that's, I could get more specific if, if need be. Thank you. I have a question uh, about uh, upcoming summer. I would love to do something non-academic or non-useful to my career over the upcoming summer, but I'm nervous I will not have the internship slash work experience by that, by that time. Do you have any advice and what non-formal things can I do to better prepare myself for my first job? So is this about doing something that's not work related or I, sorry, I'm not sure if, if your question is about the getting the first, the second part of your question was about getting the first job. The first part sounded like you wanted to do something that wasn't job related. Um, I think that's the issue is that it, it's finding time to do something non work related while also worried about sort of preparing for that first job. Oh, I see. Balancing that. Uh, yeah. I mean, some of this I would say comes down to personal finances. Like, is it okay if you don't have that first, if you delay the first job by a little bit and just go off and this is kind of a funny time. In normal times, I would say go travel, go, you know, get on a, a bus or a car or, or an airplane and go somewhere um, and just immerse yourself in something different. It's a little ob obviously hard right now with, with the, the world environment. Um, I, I would, I mean, there's, there's a lot of volunteering you can do as well. I mean, you know, if you go back, you know, to the, the gap year stuff, right? There's things you can do maybe in your local community even where you are doing something not necessarily career related, but, you know, you feel good about where you can also later frame it as, hey, I did this and this is what I learned from it. Like, imagine you worked at a food bank, just to pick an example. I, I live near San Francisco here. Um, 
you know, I volunteer there before and I, I put stuff in boxes, but I can imagine if I was more involved there, you know, maybe I could get involved in helping them organize something, right? Um, I mean, most, many of the skill, I mean, this, this is very hard skills, like, you know, can you write C++ code or Java code, right? Those are very specific, but a lot of the skills that allow you to, to, to grow and excel in your, in your, in your career, um, I, I left off communications there as well, but I mean, it's helping organizations do things better, whether you're getting paid for it, like, you know, at Google or Facebook or you're at a food bank or something. So I would look for like volunteer things, excuse me, in your own community that you can do, um, that you might feel, hopefully you'd feel good about it, that it contribute, but also that you could later frame as, hey, you know, I, I, did, I did this, I gave back, but also I gained some skills. Um, there's always ways to frame things. I'm going to, let me, let me give a different example just from my own life. It's, it's not related to, to um, before the career or not, but just, this is an example about framing things. So part of my PhD studies were around telecommunications policy. Um, and the job I ended up, one of the jobs I pursued, and the job I ended up taking was to teach, you know, um, become a professor in a, in a local business school. And I remember that I had a conversation there, and one of the, the people, smart guy, but he, he was like, you studied policy, this is a business school. You know, why is any of that pu public policy relevant to us? And I remember my somewhat sarcastic answer was, public policy is, sometimes takes the form of regulations which affects industry, which, you know, surprise, surprise, industry is business. And so it's really the flip side. And so my takeaway here is you can get, you have a lot of creative license in how you frame, um, like how you unbundle, if you go back to the unbundling, right? If you think of something you did, how, how can you unbundle this and repackage it together to, to show it is legitimate experience to help you, you know, get your job later? Maybe that, that's part of the messaging as well. And I don't think it's spin. I, I think it's legitimately that like, you know, I was in this, as an example, I was in this food bank and I helped them organize some process. You know, used to take seven people four hours. Now it takes, you know, four people two hours, you know, to do this. Process improvement is super important in lots of organizations, right? It doesn't have to be that you did it, you know, just did it's some big name place. Thank you. Uh, a question from Vitor. I'm a past candidacy in my PhD, but decided to take a step back and explore different directions before deciding whether to head back to academia or continuing, continue exploring other interesting opportunities like you did. What made you choose to pursue a PhD at CMU and how did that play into what you wanted to do and achieve? Um, I actually wanted to go back to, I actually wanted to be in school for a while. I mean, one could argue, you know, there were more practical approaches than the one that I took. Um, you know, I had benefited from having a PhD from Carnegie Mellon. I'm pretty sure that's how, you know, I, Google called me one day and said, hey, do you want to, you know, do you want to talk to us? But um, sorry, James, repeat the question. I, I lost my train of thought here. It's, I guess, about sure. choosing practical in academia. Yeah, it's about uh, exploring. Um... Uh, someone uh, Tor wants to know about uh, whether to head back to academia or continue exploring yeah. other interesting opportunities like you did. What made you choose to pursue a PhD and, and how did that play into what you wanted to do and achieve? Yeah, so I guess I answered, started to answer the second part of that. I mean, for me, it was sort of phase of career. I just, I was feeling kind of burned out from what I was doing. I wanted to recharge and gain some new skills. Um, I think more generally, just if you think about the thing you want to do next or how you want to grow, you know, like if you want to be a professor, for example, most of the time, you can go to, you know, smaller colleges, but quite often you need a PhD. It's certainly easier to get a PhD, you know, early, earlier in your career than later. Um, but I would just try to figure out what, what, what's the thing you're itching to do. I, I really am a big, big believer in just trying to figure out the thing that you internally feels like it's, it's, more, it's more satisfying for you to, to do. And, and I don't mean go lay in a beach, it's satisfying, but I mean, you know, in terms of like where you're going to grow and, and you feel like you'll grow and develop from. Um, you know, when, when I was, I, I was in grad school twice, I did both times full time. Um, you know, I know lots of people that go to grad, do graduate studies, masters in particular, you know, while they're still working. And so sometimes you can even do both of those. Um, so the thing, I, I mentioned what motivated me to go back and get graduate studies. I, I feel like that's kind of unique to my situation. It, it, you know, sometimes, you know, markets are in a terrible state. And there's really no jobs. And so, you know what, now's a good time to go back. Um, but, but I think the best way is the organic way. Just, you know, what, how do you feel like you're going to grow the most, you know, and what might open up the doors you want, you want to open up? I don't mean in 10 years from now, but, you know, in a couple of years from now. Yeah. 
question from Amara. What made you want to switch from teaching to working in industry? Also, since you focused on developing MBA programs and SFSU, do you think that having an MBA slash business leadership type of degree makes employees more successful? I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. I think an MBA is an entirely optional degree. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are lots of, there are lots of business and strategy and, and product managers, for example, that studied a technical field and an MBA is an opportunity for them to broaden their, their horizons, you know, broaden their, their understanding, but even the credential that they, you know, proven that they do understand. And so in many business orgs, that, that's a useful thing. Um, you know, the longer I've worked, the, the less I'm convinced that any particular degree really matters because I keep meeting people that are super, super successful that don't have any degree. Um, so about my switching, um, basically, I, this is a harder one to go into. Um, I, I, was, I was at a university, I was teaching, I was enjoying, enjoying it a lot, you know, at SF State. It's, you know, it, it wouldn't, it's not a world-class institution, but it's a, it's a good institution. And, you know, I was thoroughly enjoying the teaching aspect of it there. Um, Google called one day and said, hey, do you want to interview here? And I remember my initial reaction was no, I, you know, I have a job. And then, you know, I, luckily I thought about it before I answered and I said, in my mind, I was thinking the stuff I'm teaching, you know, I, I could learn a lot from that interview. This gets back to my earlier point about just go talk to people. The reason I took the first Google interview was because I thought I would learn a lot from that interview that would help me at the university. Um, it just, the interview happened to be really interesting. We, you know, they continued and continued and continued until eventually it was interesting enough to go there. Um, but I went over to do kind of this thing I took, you know, from the university for the first couple of years, but I didn't really have to make a decision until after a couple of years. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of friends and former classmates that, you know, are academics and, and they absolutely love it. Um, I, I mean, I, I love studies and I love learning, but you know, I, I'm much happier, I think in a, in a practical environment, you know, my, my own sort of professional heroes tend not to be academics. You know, I, I don't, there's not a, that, that, it's not a negative on the academics. It is most of the people I've encountered. This, there's, there's some exceptions, um, but most of the people that I've can relate to and that I, you know, aspire to be, you know, to do more of what they, how they've done things, you know, have been in practitioners, super smart practitioners that, you know, had lots of academic training, but, you know, didn't choose academia. That's my personal choice. Awesome. Uh, I think I'll wrap it up. There's, there was two questions generally about sort of um, traveling abroad and, and working abroad. So I will sort of uh, weave those in together. Um, I, someone asked, I'm, I am also interested in working abroad. Aside from the cultural experiences that it can offer, what other important values um, or what is the most important value that working abroad offered you personally? And also someone was asking, um, or Alina was asking, can you sort of tell the, the, your favorite tra uh, traveling experience and why it was impactful to you? So both of those are sort of working abroad and, and traveling uh, related. Sure. I I mean, I took a, my first trip to Asia. I took, um, I, I spent three weeks in, in three different countries in Asia. I spent you know, one week of that in the Philippines, visiting in very, very remote areas, visiting a college friend that had joined Peace Corps. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say if there was a metric that, you know, like impact on my life per unit of time spent, you know, if there's some metric like that, you know, that, that one week probably would have had the biggest impact on my outlook. Um, I think it, it gave me much going overseas, especially early on, you know, in general, it gave me a much better perspective on myself and, and, and what, what I consider normal. You know, it's easy if you grew up in one place that, you know, whether or not you recognize it, you know, there, there's a certain set of normal behaviors and thinking, et cetera, and spending time in another place, you just realize how relative that is. And it's not that the first one's wrong. It just means that that's just how the, that, that group of people, how that community thinks. And for me, that awareness of, how different people view life and normal, you know, what, what they consider normal. It's not like I had a conversation about what's normal to you, but I mean, just how people just view and perceive different, perceive life very differently to me has always been very fascinating. So that's probably one of the things I learned the most is um, that is, and, and therefore it gave me great perspective into myself and my own, my own views, et cetera. You know, that's probably one of the, the greatest impacts I had. And James, sorry, there was one more part of that. Um, 
Was there one more part or did I catch both of that? Uh, the answer? second part of it was basically asking what was your, your favorite experience and sort oh. of uh, a broader, if that's even possible to, yeah. <laughs> to boil down. I, I, I'll share one. I won't say it's a favorite, but just one thing that came to mind when, when you asked. Um, I don't know if it's on TV so much anymore, but when I was growing up, there used to be these commercials on television all the time of typically some white missionary off in, in some remote village of some country saying, hey, please give a dollar a day and you can feed this family, you know, for a month kind of thing. And when I was in the Philippines, I, I actually went to the other side of that coin. I, I, you know, encountered some people in some of the missions that were helping, et cetera. And I remember one time we were walking through the jungle and I was taking a picture of someone with my camera and someone responded, hey, we're being Kodaked. Anyway, that, that always struck me. These are people that were, had a super high quality of life in a very low standard of living, like how happy people were even without stuff. Maybe that's the other thing, distinguishing in my life between quality of experiences that distinguish between quality of life and standard of living. I used to equate those two and I realized that they, in some countries like this one, they have a lot to do with each other, but in many countries they have nothing to do with each other. Awesome, thank you. Joshua, if you want, do you have a hard stop or do you mind answering one more question? Um, I'm, I'm okay, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, the, the question is, can you, do you have advice about interviewing at, at YouTube for as someone who's worked there for 13 years or working, uh, interviewing at Google, like what, what would you say are the important things um, for these students to sort of keep in mind um, if, they, if they do want to sort of, that is their dream job if they're looking towards that? Sure. Um, there's a tendency, I think, for people that have worked a long time, I'm one of those people, that to tout your experience. And I, my, my understanding of Google and in similar, I mean, I know Google, but my understanding is of similar companies is you know, demonstrating, again, the skills I threw on that slide there, I mean, demonstrating that you don't just bring lots of experience, but you bring, you know, a very um, fertile ability to, to adapt and that, you know, you're good collaborating and dealing with ambiguity and learning new things. Um, probably learning new things. The ability to learn new things is, is probably one of, the, one of the key key skills that people look for. Um, and so the extreme of this, the extreme opposite example or count, the extreme counter example to this is, you know, I've worked for 20 years. I've worked in enterprise infrastructure. You guys have enterprise infrastructure. You don't know what you're doing. You know, that, that's like you won't even make it through the door, right? And so being open-minded and having an ability to learn and able to leverage your experience um, in a new environment is, is a very useful way to do that. Yeah. I mean, those are important skills. Therefore, useful. It's not like an interview trick. That's like actually what will help you succeed, I guess is why I'm saying it. Yeah. Great. Joshua, thank you so much for, for sharing an hour with us and, and sharing your sort of career path and also answering a lot of personal uh, questions from, from the Zuglo School students. And um, uh, I think everyone really, really appreciates it. And I would love to send out a, an intro or a, a quick invitation for you to join our Slack and, and meet a few of our students there and possibly have a few interactions if possible. Sure. Thank you, James. Great facility. Yeah. Thank you. All right. You have a great night. Okay. Bye. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye.